And our purpose today is really to provide a toolbox for our audience, you know, um, to think about not just survive, but also thrive in this critical time. Um, so at this moment, let me just introduce our um, panelists. And um, as you can see, our panelists today is kind of like a who's who in the Chinese language field. Um, so if I read their bios, you know, one by one, uh, we probably won't have time for this uh, panel discussion. So I will just do a one sentence or two sentences introduction of everyone. And we will put their bio on the uh, website once we have the recording there, you know, and then you can read about their amazing achievements and experiences. All right. So my um, introduction is going to be by alphabetical order. And so the first one is Dr. Jeffrey uh, Bizell. He's the head of school at Chinese American International School in San Francisco, California. And for those of you who are familiar with Chinese immersion education, you know CASE is the first Chinese um, immersion language program in the United States. And it's um, 30 something going on being 40 years old. And um, Jeff holds a PhD in Chinese from the uh, University of Wisconsin in medicine. Welcome Jeff, wave your hand so people could know who you are. Wonderful, xie xie. Um, the second uh, panelist that we'll introduce is Marty Chen. Hi, Marty. Marty has uh, been teaching um, in Utah since uh, 2003. And she just told us today, later she's going to uh, attend the wedding of her former student. <laughs> My goodness, you know, and um, she's been teaching in elementary immersion program and now she teaches in high school. She was also the um, coordinator and coach for the Utah Chinese immersion program. Welcome, Marty. Our next uh, speaker panelist is no stranger to uh, many of you who uh, it's Bob Davis, Robert Davis. And Bob was the uh, executive director of Chinese language and culture initiatives at College Board. And he is now the global CEO of Mandarin Matrix and also uh, education advisor for many politicians and organizations. Welcome, Bob. Bye. And our next um, speaker panelist is uh, Chris Livakari who is no stranger to us as well. He uh, is the uh, head of school of uh, Presidio Knowles School in San Francisco. And uh, he's also the senior advisor to China Learning Initiatives of uh, Global Education at Asia Society. Uh, before his life as a headmaster, he was a beloved teacher of Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Welcome, Chris. Um, our next panelist is uh, Edward Park. Hi, Eddie. Um, Eddie is a former um, principal of Adobe Blobs Elementary School in Poway uh, Unified School District, and also the uh, Bernard Mandarin Magnus School in San Diego, California. And both the school has amazing turnaround success stories and uh, including recent uh, recognition from the uh, US Department of Education as one of the national blue ribbon schools. Congratulations. And uh, Eddie is also being uh, recently appointed to be the uh, director of um, um, global language and innovative programs at Poway um, Unified School District and he will be responsible for setting up more foreign language programs in K-12 schools. Congratulations, Eddie. 
Our next speaker is Dr. Frank Tang Lixing, Tang Lixing Jiaoshou. He's a research professor uh, and also the uh, founder of um, the um, multilingual, multicultural teacher program at the uh, NYU, New York University. And uh, in two, year 2000, he established the uh, K-16 Chinese language teacher education program. And over the past uh, 20 years or so, he has um, uh, over 150 graduates who are um, certified in teaching in K-12 schools nationally. And here's a little um, shout out for um, <laughs> my personal connection with uh, Frank. He was um, a committee member of my dissertation at when I was working on my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. So thank you. 一日为师,终身为父,谢谢唐老师. Yeah, and our last but not the least uh, panelist is uh, Cleopatra who is the uh, director for China language, um, China learning initiatives um, under the uh, um, global education at Asia Society. He's also a uh, you know, unwavering supporter for Celine. So thank you for your support. And before she joined Asia Society, she worked for seven years at uh, Beida as the um, their international program manager. And she's also a graduate of Beida, uh, Guanghua Management School of, uh, um, uh, Guanghua School of Management. And uh, so welcome everyone. What a list and thank you for spending your Saturday with us, you know. Um, and our format today, just to let the audience know, it's going to be very organic, you know. So basically, I'll just pay, probably post the first question to you, um, and then you will carry on. I know this is a, um, you know, a, a, a group that needs no um, encouragement, and everybody has so much to offer. And uh, so basically we have four questions, you know, what are the issues? And number two is what are factors to be mindful and strategies? And number three would be, you know, some uh, resources that you can share with the audience. And um, number four would be your, uh, you know, parting words, your one big advice to all everyone. So the first question, and I guess maybe we can go by alphabetical order for the first round of question. And after that, we'll just let the uh, flow take care of us, you know? So the first question is that all of you are at different vintage point. And so from your perspective, you know, what are some issues or challenges that Chinese language programs or educators and even parents are facing. And uh, so why don't we start um, from you, Jeff? Right, um, okay. So um, I think I'd like to uh, sort of step back and sort of look at this in context. Um, I think inherent in your question, Shuhan, is the idea that um, events over the last, you know, two or three years, including um, comments by the former president, um, the pandemic, uh, increasing incidents of reports of anti-Asian uh, harassment and violence, um, have impacted Chinese language program and. And, and perhaps, you know, created a, a feeling of, of crisis or even, you know, fear and dread among many of our colleagues um, and our students. And I think it's important at this point to step back and sort of take the long view and look at an historical context. Um, like many of my friends and colleagues on this call, um, <clears throat> I lived for a fairly long time in China. And while I was there, I remember a couple of um, instances. One was in 1988. There was a, a giant, uh, violent demonstration in Nanjing against African students that was 
sparked by a, um, rumors about some 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 incidents on a campus and and uh, you know then later in 2005 I remember these violent demonstrations against businesses that had connections to Japan and I believe that was sparked by you know the way history of World War II was being taught in Japan and um, some maybe the elevation of Japan and the United Nations or something like that. And my point is not to point fingers at China, but to, but to just point out that as human beings and in the world, we're, we're dealing with sort of ongoing violence and hatred uh, directed at, at different groups. Um, and in the United States, um, we don't have to look very far just the last few, you know, few years to see how, how, you know, this has surfaced and resurfaced. And so what I'd like to point out is that um, as Chinese language educators and as world language educators, we're actually, there are, there's not a quick fix to this problem. We are actually part of the solution. Um, and that, you know, by, by, you know, looking at this in a larger context um, and taking a long view you, you, you're actually playing a role directly um, in, in countering ignorance and counter, c- countering hate. And I can pretty much guarantee that by virtue of learning from you and learning about you and learning your language and about your culture, um, your students will hopefully, and, and I'm, I'm confident of this, not be able to demonize Chinese or, or, or anyone else that is different from them. Um, and so I think I would adopt the position of like what I'm doing in my career is meaningful at countering a trend that, that goes way beyond the last couple or three years of, of sort of anti-Asian, anti Chinese sentiment um, and is part of a much larger sort of human problem. And, and, and this simply, this simply, I think emphasizes the importance of the work we do. And now is not the time to be afraid. Now is the time I think to charge forward and to redouble our efforts um, at addressing these issues. Johan, you're muted. Yeah, basically. Yeah, Marty? Yes, and uh, thanks for this opportunity. So I would like to come in from a teacher's point of view, and I really uh, touched by what Jeff just says, we are parts of the solutions. And for me, as a teacher, I think I talked to Shuhan about this. I feel the teacher's job is not to tell, especially in public school or any school setting, I feel teachers should not see yourself as a victim, as Chinese teachers. This is so important because I feel passionate about this. When the anti-Asian was going this, the demonstration or the violence behavior happened in United States, I hate to come into the classroom, tell the students, you know, I'm Chinese, you need to be fair with me. And to me, I had to step back and think, when there was Black Lives Matter, did I stand up to say something about this? When they're indigenous people, they have this kind of demonstration, did I say something about this? I feel a teacher's job should be broader. We should not narrow in as a victim to tell the student you need to stand up for Chinese. I just feel if a teacher you can show love toward anybody, I I have a high hope the student will also copy your behavior, learn your culture to love and embrace other cultures as well. I want to tell a very short story, a quick story. When uh, 2009, when Utah was going to start the Chinese immersion in my school district, well, in the different school district, I was uh, asked to go to the school district to work. The first letter we received from a parent was a very angry parent say, you are not coming to our society, uh, to our community to teach communist. 
And so, and then you should not try to train a group of red soldiers. And I was really shocked to see, to hear this kind of comment. And I was joking, I say, but I'm from Taiwan. <laughs> so, but I think the, the point is like what Jeff just mentioned, we are surrounded by people, they don't know our culture. And what we can do is really stay there, but not being, uh, try not to look like a victim. We should show the teachers and the students that we deeply care about all human beings, not just Chinese. That's from a teacher's point of view when you're in the classroom. Thank you. That's really from the heart as well. Yeah, Bob. Great. Hi. Thanks, and thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I, you know, I think there's a lot of issues going on right now, and I think there's a lot of voices um, being present presenting China um, with their own narrative, right? And what I don't see is sort of a counter narrative that is that would be interesting to the students. And so I think one of the issues is actually meeting students where they are and finding what they find interesting. Um, and, and, and I talk about this a lot. Um, you know, Chinese culture is, is deep and it's rich and there's so much history, but it's also an incredibly modern culture. And I think that um, what we need to do as educators is, is help students find those things that are interesting to them, right? And, and to control the narrative a little bit better um, because right now everybody but us is controlling this narrative. Um, I think if you look at uh, Korea and Japan, they've done a tremendous job of, of finding very kind of fun, modern ways to engage young people, to, to get, get young people interested in their culture, which drives them to learning the language and to being more engaged. And um, China has not done that as well um, and, and, and also has to try to do that at the same time as battling with all this political conversation, right? And so even if they are doing a good job or there's things emerging in youth culture in China, they're not bubbling to the top because the other conversations are so prevalent. Um, we often are accused as Chinese language educators as teaching politics in our classrooms. And in my experience, I've never seen that. I've uh, visited hundreds and hundreds of Chinese classrooms, right? So this is an unfair and untrue accusation. Um, and so I think we also have to be more clear as educators what we are teaching classroom and celebrate those things and, and not assume that the parents or the community know this inherently, right? And so um, to continue to celebrate what we're doing and to present it and to be articulate and to be proud of the work that we're doing in, in, in all these environments. So I, I would say that's kind of a big issue is just kind of is not really rebranding Chinese, but making sure that it's on brand, right, for the students that we're working with and, and that it's appealing to them and that you know, we're not um, reluctant to to help connect them to the things that they would be interested in. And, and, and part of that is just having the conversation with them to say, what are you interested? What brought you to Chinese? What made you interested in Chinese? And then building on that. Wow, that is a really powerful statement and, and, and point of view. Uh, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Uh I just maybe like to try to echo some of the comments of my colleagues um, because I think I've had a, an interesting experience being, um, you know, first myself, a student of Russian as a high school student back in the late 80s, right? This is like end of the Cold War. Then of Chinese and Japanese in the early 90s um, at a time when Japan was kind of booming and going to take over the universe. And China was really not on anyone's radar screens until kind of later in the mid, mid to late 90s. So I think there are some historical lessons we can take from the experiences of other language programs in the U.S. And I think there's an unfortunate tendency in American life and American education to um, have an inability to focus on um, the, the broader context. I want to come back to the idea of the context and opening things up, because I think one of the things that we do as Chinese language programs sometime, sometimes is get narrowly focused on the Chinese piece right, that we are Chinese language educators, that we're doing a U.S.-China exchange, but we're also part of a more broad effort to teach Americans the value of global competency and multilingualism. And I think to the extent that we can look to the other language programs that are out there, that we can work together as part of a broader field 
with our colleagues who are teaching Spanish and Arabic and, and Russian and whatever, I think that also opens us up to, uh, to a different perspective and it also maybe tamps down some of the political tension and political perspectives that people are putting upon our field. Um, I think there's a lot we can learn from our colleagues. And one of the interesting things I've seen as a both a Chinese and Japanese language educator over the last you know, couple of decades is right now, there are some wonderful Japanese language programs that are up and running, but there aren't many of them. Um, but the ones that have survived after the political and economic kind of stimulus was gone were the ones where the kids were smiling, engaged, loved the program. And I remember about 10 or 15 years ago interviewing Marty for a publication we were doing about Chinese immersion. And I just remember everything Marty said, I was like, she's like the, the model teacher that can excite and stimulate and motivate our students. And I think going back to Marty's point about the teachers not being victims and to uh, Jeff's point about the teachers being leaders in this space, I think we need to come back to the, the, the smiling faces of our kids because I'll tell you that even when in districts where Japanese was like on the chopping block because nobody cared about Japan anymore, in places where the kids were super motivated, loved their teachers, had a robust exchange program with Japan, those programs stayed. Those programs continued to be supported. And so we have a wonderful opportunity as teachers to do that. Um, maybe just lastly, because there's so much here to unpack, but um, I previously was like Cleopatra um, after me and Shuhan before me, I was uh, at Asia Society working on the China Learning Initiatives for a number of years. And during that time, I'll tell you that it was one of the, the it was some, we had some rough moments with the Chinese government because we did lots of stuff that was pretty controversial, like dissonant artists doing exhibitions in New York, like programs about you know, Tiananmen Square, about Taiwan. Um, invi we invited people from the Tibetan government in exile. We did all kinds of things to get ourselves in trouble as an organization. But the work that I was leading, which was people to people exchange primarily, it was teachers and students from both countries working together. That was always a thing that we could agree on. So even when the powers that be were fighting each other and throwing fists at each other, they all agreed that let's keep the people to people exchange going. Let's keep the school exchanges going. Let's keep the kids learning about each other. And so I think we just need to continue to, again, open up, see ourselves as part of a larger field and also emphasize the role that we play in people to people exchange and in keeping the stability and constructiveness of our relationship. That is really, <sighs> Powerful, wonderful. And um, so um, the next would be uh, Tang Jiaoshou. Yeah. I, I think it should be Eddie. Oh, OK. And Good morning, everybody. It doesn't matter who goes first. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eddie Park calling in from the most beautiful city in America, San Diego, America's finest city. Good to see all of you. <laughs> um, the testimony has been just uh, incredibly powerful. And uh, just um, everybody's sentiments, you know, absolutely, um, you know, on point. Um, you know, the rhetoric in the last couple of years have absolutely had a impact on even the most, uh, you know, elementary school. Elementary school is all about having fun learning languages and, you know, these new progressive programs for our students to be able to take advantage of. And, you know, all the resources that's been lost in the last couple of years and with the learning loss uh, during this pandemic has just been gigantic. Um, in San Diego, um, you know, the Mandarin program is more popular than ever. You know, we have waiting lists like there's no tomorrow. San Diego Unified, Poway Unified School District. And where we're at is, you know, in a higher socioeconomic level and what have you. And my deep question is, how do we make Mandarin language and culture to be more accessible and provide equity amongst all students? You know, that's my number one question. And so you, you've got parents who are more aware and, you know, for their students in the future, which is the reason why 
they gravitate towards uh, our, our program. But, you know, the age, the issues that we are going through is the age-old question of right now, it was already our teacher recruitment and the resources were already pretty skinny. And it was getting better as more schools around the country was expanding. But in the last couple of years, because of the the political, socio-political situation um, with our country and China and what have you has really pretty much decimated the, uh, the, the teacher pool uh, as, well as, um, as well as the university resources that we used to have with San Diego State University. You know, simple things like we, the way we were able to get parents rah rah up and the district administration and city officials to be excited is simple things like cultural events during Moon Festival or Lunar New Year, you know, because of, because of our partnership with university, like in China, like Shaman University, you had these world-class, world-renowned performers come and really highlight the deep cultures and the kids are wide eyed and they're having so much fun. This is what we're missing at this point, you know, simple things like that. But, you know, um, the parents still want it. And so how do we get some of those resources back and how do we uh, make that more of a wider angle of uh, opportunities for our students? So uh, coupled with, you know, public school principals you're, we're creating a program, we're program, uh, creating a existing, in an existing public school, we're creating and implementing an immersion program or the FLESS program and, and trying to balance and to make sure that everybody is united. And so one teacher or one group of teacher uh, feels that, you know, um, more concentration is on this and, and you're, you're the second priority. These are all kind of balancing, culture balancing. These are very, very difficult thing to do, you know, and to make sure that there's unity inside the school and making sure that there isn't a school within a school, which I've seen so many schools, you know, um, fall off from it. And so these are all already a challenging times, but with, with you know, the bigger aspects of uh, the political situation, it reverberates down to things like elementary school and trying to create a pathway has been very, very difficult too. And just like Bob said, how do we rebrand or brand Mandarin? You know, the Korean, the uh, influx of the Korean K-pop and Japanese anime and what have you, they're utilizing that and kids are drawn to it and they're screaming and saying, what, how, how do we do this in high schools and what have you? And so recently, I've been in my job for the last uh, four days now as the uh, director of global <laughs> languages and looking at a wider angle. Just like Bob had said, I am trying to look at that and work with principals and how we can uh, not rebrand, but how do we make it a little bit more modern? How do we how do we attract the students to come in? What is the uh, what is the uh, similarities or, you know, something, you know, something that's uh, equitable to things like, you know, K-pop and things like that for kids to get involved. And so it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's definitely a brainstorming session for sure. And all the uh, esteemed educators here on this, uh, on this call right now would be the best resources at this point. But yeah, it's a ongoing struggle and, you know, there's a new principal at my school right now. And uh, it wasn't planned, but it's another Korean American person running a Mandarin program. <laughs> and, and I am, uh, you know, I have to, I have to, as another Korean American person, you know, running this program for the last 14 years and not being able to speak Mandarin and really being able to uh, get resources for, from our awesome Mandarin uh, coordinators and what have you, I have to share that same uh, conversation, the struggles and what are some of the ideas out there to, uh, you know, to overcome this. And so it's an ongoing struggle and, and it's just coupled with uh, even more of uh, challenges. And so, but yeah. uh, it, it's very popular folks. 
very popular. Mandarin is still very popular. That's very encouraging. And uh, on that note, uh, Frank, would you uh, chime in with your insights? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I echo a lot of my uh, colleagues have been talking about. I just want to uh, add two points. One is that the challenges, one of the challenges with, uh, I think uh, both Marty and, and Chris and Bob all mentioned is how we can help the, the American people in general to generate an understanding about the Chinese people. Well, all this so far uh, we see, we hear are the government versus government, politicians versus politicians, or the press versus the press. But where are the silent majority? That is the people versus people. The, the, the biggest population in the world, the Chinese people and the American people. Now, both sides have misconceptions about each other. And because of the reasons you have all mentioned. And Americans are not well known for its understanding of the world. Uh, that we all know about that. Not to mention uh, about a country like China, which has a totally different you know, system. Let me give you a real story. One of my students recently told me he just attended this summer a workshop called National Consortium for Teaching About Asia, sponsored by the Freeman Foundation. So attend, the attendance participants are mostly teachers and he, this student himself uh, was a math teacher and now working for the New York State Department. And he hears a story, a question raised by a social studies teacher teaching Americans, an American woman. The question is, do you know if there are music schools or music conservatory in China? And my student was like, it's speechless. A question like this out of the mouth of a social studies teacher? And that tells us millions about how much we know about China and how much probably you may see hear the same stories from the Chinese, how much they know about America. You know, this is falling on the, the shoulders of our teachers is not just teaching the language. And I always say, and we have to generate a sort of communication between the people. Now the pandemic has, has brought disasters all over. But one thing it did bring us the advantage is the technology, is the communication through say Zoom or anything. I think what we need to do is to make the best out of this technology. And now we can't visit each other, but we can still interact and communicate with each other through technology. How can we do that? And while the study abroad program number is down, but I think the online programs should go up. So this is one story I, I would like to share uh, with you. The other is what I'm concerned is the challenging is the number of qualified uh, Chinese language teachers. From the NYU point of view, we had the very first uh, certification programs for Ch developing Chinese language teachers uh, for the, from the help from the State Department and the help from uh, uh, Freeman Foundation. And we have produced wonderful teachers. And here we go, our colleagues like Chris and Robin are the best, best we can find out of NYU's program. But now we see a drop in numbers for the first time is in enrollment in our Chinese teachers program, which really worries us. We can't depend on volunteers anymore. We have to have our teachers trained by our own schools. Over the past you know, dozen years, we have turned out over 200 and Robin just reminded me 300. 
qualified teachers teaching all over the world, all over the United States. But when we see this trend coming down, we are a little worried. If we don't have qualified and devoted teachers in the Chinese language programs are not going to you know, survive in this country. So I just want to mention these two points for now. Yeah, that, that's really a, a, a white elephant in the room issue, you know, teachers. And um, before we solve that, let's hear what uh, Cleopatra has to say. Thank you, Shuhan. So the East Society, we work with 96 partner schools across 25 states um, in the United States. And so I've been very fortunate to go to a number of schools um, and kind of see what uh, is happening amongst Chinese language programs. And unfortunately, there's a stark equity issue. So in areas that are in higher income uh, areas and areas where the parents are more globally minded, you're seeing this huge demand for Chinese language. It's like nonstop. It doesn't matter whether the place is very conservative, is a red state, a red city, it doesn't matter. Parents are demanding that that school and that school district provide opportunities for Chinese language and for Chinese lang uh, language exchange and different opportunities to learn about Chinese culture for their students. Meanwhile, in our schools where are, they are in lower income uh, tax brackets, are they in more rural areas, the programs are really not doing very well. Um, and the question of why, why should my child learn Chinese? all the way to the negative perceptions of China is a communist country. Um, I don't want my child to learn Chinese. I don't want them to engage with Chinese are really uh, the conversations that you're seeing in these areas. And what we have to do is both explain to parents that Chinese culture and China and learning Chinese is a part of engaging with a greater uh, global diaspora of Chinese people. Chinese language and Chinese culture and Chinese people don't just extend in China. Chinese people are everywhere. Um, my husband is from West Africa. When the first time that I went, there were lots of Chinese people. And I asked them, I said, is this common in most countries in Africa? They're like, yeah, usually you'll see lots of Chinese people um, in a lot of countries in Africa, all over the United States, there are Chinese people. And so we have to do a better job of explaining that China is our Chinese language is a local language, a local language in the United States in the same way that we look at Spanish. No one learns Spanish in the United States just to go to Spain or to go to Mexico or to go to Dominican Republic. They learn it because they think it's, you know, important and essential for their work or their life in the United States. And that's something that we definitely have to do a better job of. And then secondly is the student aspect, the student engagement. Um, as some of my other colleagues did state, you know, just like Korea and Japan, you know, have such a soft culture, soft power. Um, and this is why, because they have the spark of the interest of students, um, why students decide to learn Korean or learn Japanese. And so Asia Society, about two years ago, we started um, a media platform called Chinocity. And basically what we're doing is um, producing social media content, producing articles um, for that Generation Z to really engage with young people in a way that's actually interesting to them. So for example, um, during Lunar New Year, we did a Lunar Cook-Off series where we had social media influencers who speak Chinese but aren't non-native Chinese um, cook different Chinese dishes and see who had the best dish, right? Um, we do a Why Speak Chinese contest every year where we have students uh, upload a one minute video of themselves um, explaining like a fun story or interesting story about them learning or speaking Chinese and share on social media. And so by doing things that actually reach out to students and engage with students, this is the way that we help to counter some of those narratives and get students interested um, in Chinese culture from a very modern perspective. Wow, <laughs> the, uh, it, it's really wonderful. The, uh, the the perspectives, each one is so valid, you know, and and um, also touch on different aspects of the uh, a, a very complex issue. And in fact, you know, really the 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 issues are 
um, multi-dimensional and multi-layer, and there's no one size fits all solution or thinking about it, you know. And so based on what has been said, you know, um, and I, what I gather from my notes would be like, we need to really look at the macro as well as micro environment where we're in and not just think about teaching Chinese for the sake of teaching Chinese and language and culture, you know, have to really think about uh, the larger why we are doing this, you know, the, you, you have to believe and have passion in that and thinking about how can we really collab collaboratively create a CPA, you know, and that would be kind of K-PA type of thing and to excite the young people and give them more reason and purpose and also platform, uh, not just learning, but also using the language, you know, and um, one, and, and so in this environment, maybe people to people engagement is probably even more important. And actually, personally, I, I also have um, this uh, belief because when I was um, a student of language policy and planning, I really believed in top down and dedicated myself in working with the government of different levels and trying to come up with policies and uh, um, you know, practices uh, um, that promote language learning and teaching. But um, the more I'm in the field, the more I become believe, you know, to, to believe the uh, power of bottom up. And, and we really need to engage more grassroots, you know. And so far, I haven't really heard much about how do we engage parents because they are so important. And, 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 and um, there are other issues and how do we also engage? And some of you also mentioned to collaborate with teachers, uh, colleagues of uh, different disciplines, you know, and, and really create that environment that's favorable for language learning and not just Chinese, but all languages and really think about how do we take care of the, uh, not take care, but address the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, in a very, um, um, in a social justice way. And, and so those would be the uh, questions that we want to follow up on. What factors, what elements that maybe people in their context need to, how do they even go about, not, not necessarily the what elements, but how to do that, the, how to analyze that, how to analyze your local situation so that you can um, sort of develop a, a set of strategies or talking points that you can address and you can deal with that. Um, all the way from your students, your colleagues, your administrators, and your parents, and, and the community in, in which you are in. So the, the floor is open. Who would like to take the first shot? So, Shuhan, I'll, um, okay. I'll, I'll jump in, and, and I'll try to keep this brief. Um, I, I want to speak to your kind of one point of your sort of wide ranging frame setting for this. Um, and it's, it's the, it's the issue of um, diversity equity issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and also social emotional learning. Um, I'm in the Bay area. And so I can't speak for the, the, the priorities of schools and school districts all over the country, but um, from my limited knowledge, I think that right now, um, schools and school districts and families are very interested, increasingly interested in, in sort of social emotional learning, in addressing in a deep and meaningful way issues of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I guess I would caution against um, viewing a second, you know, viewing Chinese language as a medium through which to teach content about these things. I don't, I don't think it's wrong to do that, but I think that, that a, a different way to look at it and one that, that we, we can also articulate to administrators and parents is that the very, the, the process of learning a new language and about a new culture 
is itself, I think, an, an, an outstanding mechanism to sort of really deeply understand and internalize important concepts and notions, which we tend to label as social emotional learning or as diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you know, I think that learning and engaging with a foreign language and culture or, you know, a world language and culture requires humility, curiosity, empathy, uh, connection, and, and, and a true appreciation of difference. Um, and that the, the attitudes and the competencies that world language students gain go a lot, go, go much further than simply the mastery of the language and specific cultural knowledge about, you know, a country. Um, and they, they actually prepare kids and students to engage respectfully with a whole diversity of people. And so I would look at, I would look at world language education as a tool or a, or a path um, for fostering these attitudes and if we can articulate that, that it's the process um, that takes us there. And, and this is, I mean, I think that, that, that there's probably no group that understands this process better than the group on this call. Whether we've come to Chinese language as a second language, like myself, um, the years that I spent learning and in, and, and, and in China, um, I think made me a, a more aware person in the ways that I'm talking about. And I know that our native Chinese speaking colleagues on the call um, have had that same process coming to our country, the process of being, um, of, of approaching a new culture, a new language, um, of being sort of otherized, um, you know, has opened your eyes, I'm imagining, to just how powerful this sort of culture engagement and immersion is. And our parents and our administrators will, you know, I think if, if they, if they grasp this, will understand that world language is a path to social emotional learning goals um, and to some of our diversity, equity, and inclusion goals as well. That is so true. Yeah. And, and that's one thing that we have been saying all along is that through studying other languages and culture and people, we understand ourselves better, understand our language better and our culture, our value, you know. And it, it's in that sort of comparative mode that we are also in search of ourselves. So I remember when I was a teacher in Chinese, of Chinese, my students often ask me, you know, aren't we here to learn Chinese? Why are we talk about American value and, and American, you know, and, and, and really that, that's uh, one um, way of addressing uh, different ways of seeing, being in the world. Yeah. Who would like to uh, continue and, um, Share your um, thoughts. I, if I could just follow up on that, thank you. I, it, I, I think that was such a great point. I think empathy is such a, a powerful part of learning a language and being able to relate to people. And, and to follow up on what Cleopatra said earlier, I mean, I think that the Chinese language diaspora is so interesting, right? It is a truly a global language. Um, just this year, the United Nations named um, Chinese one of the six um, international tourist languages, tourism languages for the first time. Um, you Everywhere you go in the world, you are going to speak, meet and interact with somebody who is either Chinese or can speak Chinese. And my point here, and I, I haven't thought about this before um, hearing Cleopatra, and I, it was in, in, uh, kind of a breakthrough moment for me, is um, I think we could do better at identifying ourselves as being part of that diaspora, right? I am not culturally Chinese, right? We're ethnically Chinese. I understand that, but I am part of the Chinese language diaspora, right? And we can do the same thing with our students to say, this is, you are part of this. This is not something you are separate from, like find yourself in this. There is a place for you in Chinese language. And, and that, that means that you are part of the sort of the global community and um, you are part of the conversation, right? You're not, you're not watching it. You're part of it. Um, and, and that's important because we need your voices um, as, as part of this as well. And, and tell us, you know, like I said earlier, tell us what you're interested in and, and, you know, use your Chinese language skills, use your understanding of Chinese culture um, to build a new 
something for yourself and for your friends and for your community and, and bring it back to where you live. Um, Chinese language is, you know, needed in every field in the world right now. People need to communicate, um, be able to communicate in Chinese and many other languages. Um, but it's not something that you have to go to China to do at all. Um, you know, you can stay in the United States, you can stay in your own town and, and find a way to use Chinese in a very meaningful um, and a very, um, you know, a powerful way. And so I think, you know, reminding students that this is not the learning of something completely other, that you are actually a part of this. And the more you engage, the more you are a part of it is going to be very important. Well said. Yeah, totally. Who would like to uh, continue? Cleopatra? Yeah, you're muted. Oh, I didn't realize I was muted. I always do that. Anyway, um, I definitely agree with Bob. It's very important to, you know, give students those opportunities to speak Chinese and to highlight their voices. Um, and one of the things that I'm a big advocate for um, is for Chinese language programs to work with their local Chinese communities. I mean, this is the United States. Most cities do have a local Chinese community, have heritage schools in their community, have Chinese centers in their community, and really engaging with those students and their students together to have a really authentic environment where they're getting to understand the culture and understanding that they don't have to actually go to China to experience Chinese culture or to be a part of a Chinese speaking community. And I think that's wildly important, especially since we're in a pandemic and no one knows when we'll be able to go to China anyway. Um, and so creating those authentic connections um, is, is extremely important. Uh, and then the other thing, you know, I think is really engaging more with parents. Um, we found that what has been very successful is to do those kind of cultural events. Um, even one of um, our partner schools in Florida, they were telling me they do cultural events every year. And one of the things that they do is a game on uh, students like learning how to use chopsticks and they're like picking up Skittles because Florida and I'm from Florida so I can say this we're unhealthy people so yeah picking Skittles up with the chopsticks and using fun activities to really uh, get parents involved with their students language learning and understanding Chinese culture um, in fun and exciting ways and so I think that is it's also a part of the conversation um, and how we really deal with, you know, building grassroots support. Yeah. And at this point, I'd like to uh, invite Eddie to address this point about engaging parents, because one thing from parents, the biggest worries that I have observed is that I don't speak Chinese. How do I help my child? You know, and, and so from your perspective and sharing you know, um, a non-Chinese speaking principal, um, how, how do you work with parents on that and to, to sort of reduce their anxiety and offer them some strategies? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am ashamed for the last 14 years as a, a principal in leading and creating Mandarin program as a Korean American, and uh, have not gained the mastery of Mandarin. I am super, super embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> but I am the poster boy <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, really pushing the action on this uh, with the parents. And so, um, you know, there isn't really a magic solution for it because all the parents really know um, the reason why they are, they brought their kids over to Mandarin, you know? and the language and what Chris talked about, what Bob talked about, what Jeff talked about, you know, the endless amount of opportunities that are out there. And, you know, many of the parents um, that are there are who are non-Mandarin speakers, they want to hear from um, folks like, what do we do? How do we, how do we uh, support these, uh, support my own kids? You know, and, it, and, and one of the ways that we do this is to, um, constantly meet with parents on on a, almost on a weekly or bi-weekly basis and having having strategies like creating mandarin programs for we created a new program called flep f-l-e-p foreign language for elementary parents <laughs> <as part> of, <laughs> not flesh but flep 
these are some of the things that we created and trying to do the best that we can to promote language and culture to our parents on a, on a Friday morning and learn side by side. It kind of calms them down a little bit and see and open, um, open ideas on what the kids are learning. And doing virtual field trips during this time of the pandemic and what the classrooms look like and what they're learning. And then we had simultaneous learning that was taking place. Uh, we had online program and students in campus and we would have three video cameras set up for parents to be able to see what they're learning and going along with it, you know. And so it takes a toll on the teacher in terms of all the preparation, but you know, innovation and technology integration have opened the doors for parents to just kind of relax and be able to uh, see that you know, there is a rigorous and enriching program that's taking place. And so, and then also um, the infusion of uh, programs, you know, online platforms, learning platforms in the last few years has really, really, uh, help parents, you know, like Mandarin Matrix and, you know, uh, level readers for parents to be able to track their learning, you know, um, have given a lot of resources for non-Mandarin parents to be able to get access to, you know, and so that, that's been wonderful. I have not really had any kind of pushback from parents on, on the why. And so the conversation I'm leading these days and with teachers and educators as well, we're talking a lot about the ethnic studies and the CRTs, whether, you know, there's pushback, there's pushbacks and embracing, there's a lot of controversies over and things like that. And, you know, with, with ethnic studies, there are a lot of people who are against it, who are for it. Um, and the best neutralizing point is you know what, when we're talking about ethnic studies and, and whatever, whatever race conversation we're taking place right now, you know, best way is to learn new languages and new cultures. That's what ethnic studies is all about, appreciating the diverse culture of America. And it has been a incredibly, a, um, a incredible tool out there to have a conversation and really uh, have people understand, you know, the true ethnic study is really learning foreign languages like Mandarin language, you know, the most uh, spoken languages in the world. And at the same time, we're using that platform for uh, social justice in terms of Asian voices out there. There has been a lot of racial conversation, anti-Asian hate, you know, I feel that the, the Asian conversation in the mix right now was on for maybe three days, you know? And again, it's quiet down again. And now because of the issues that we are facing, there has been a lot of um, civic engagement amongst the Asian American AAPI groups. And most recently, the Yellow Whistle Movement, have you guys heard of that? The Yellow, Yellow Whistle Movement has brought a lot of attention out there, but it has really, given a platform for us to talk about our Asian voices. What are our Asian students, you know, struggles that are facing and, you know, things like what's important to all of us in terms of like, you know, students getting into colleges, you know, uh, what are the struggles there? What are our students facing? You know, the microaggression, the expl explicit aggressions that are taking place among school students and what have you. And so it's actually a perfect time for us to bring all this up through, um, you know, things like Mandarin language learning at our schools. And I have definitely used this platform to talk about social justice um, in terms of Asian voices. And as a director uh, right now for the district, and it, it, there's a trend out there in every school district, there's a director of equity. And so I, ha I have an opportunity to use that platform to bring Asian voices and so I am actually, uh, uh, you know, I, I am definitely using this opportunities to uh, elevate this conversation more. That's well said. Yeah. Oh, Frank. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I want to follow up on all this, the importance of um, making our voice heard. And I'm a teacher educator. So I, I'm, I'm talking again from the teacher 
uh, training and education part. Uh, we need to also at university level uh, to prepare our teachers, not just for teaching language or pedagogy or methodology. One of the things we need to work with people. We now know teachers are not going to fight all by yourself. Uh, one of my students remind me, I say, teachers, like Chinese language teachers need to have a mentality of what we say in Chinese called it, uh, that means in the good times, in the peaceful time, you need to think of danger, you need to think of difficult times. To put it uh, uh, straightforwardly is, we should always be prepared for bad times when we are in good times. So, so the Chinese language has had its boom and now it's declining. And by the way, I want to add, it's not just Chinese. If you look at the statistics by MLA, since 2013, the entire United States foreign language enrollment has been declining mm -hmm. uh, the trend. And the biggest decline for the Chinese is since 2017, which also, like many of you have already explained, it's from the outside. So we talk about teachers need to, number one, they need to go out and reach out. They shouldn't just work in the classroom. They need to go out to be an advocate. They need to have their voice heard in the foreign language department, in the foreign language department of the school. They need to have their needs heard by the leaders. You know, not all the headmasters like Eddie who have the understanding and support. You know, you have some, some people, you, you have to let them hear you. And then you need to have your voice heard at the board meeting of the school district. So in other words, we teachers need to be aware that we are not just teaching the language. We are teaching people. We're also working with students, parents, colleagues, and people of the society. And I always remember this wonderful story about a wonderful teacher in New Jersey and, and uh, Shu Han's uh, 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 a wonderful friend, Wu Weiling, at mm -hmm. UPenn. She started at a time when Chinese was at a very low point, very few school. She was a part-time teacher, but single-handedly she worked with the administrators and teachers. And eventually in her school district alone, they got 7.5 position for teachers. And imagine when you have teachers, that means the enrollment goes up. These kind of stories, I think we need to have a platform for teachers to share their stories, like the stories Marty shared. And one of the weaknesses for our Chinese teachers, and it's probably typical of Chinese, is they are shy of speaking up. You know, so they have their thinking, they have their thoughts, but they need to speak up and, and let their voice be heard. So that's probably from one side is that teachers themselves need to make an extra effort. That's it. Yeah. Shuhan, well, may, can, I, can I just one quick point to that? Because I think that's so, so right. And, and I just want to plug to our audience is that you should, Chinese language teachers should also, if they are interested, not stop there. They should become administrators. They should become school leaders. They should become district leaders so that your voices are heard and you do have a greater platform and you can help, you know, forge those paths for others that are, are, are coming along the pathway later on. And, I, you know, I don't see a lot of that right now. And I hope that that is something that we can, yeah, as a community talk about, right? Language leaders in general should be in, in more administrative positions, right? We are not limited to the classroom. We have more opportunities. So, you know, let's make sure that the, our, our, our colleagues know what those are and, and, and help identify those pathways and make sure they have the resources to get there. That is so well said. And Chris, why don't you use this point? to kind of elaborate and, and maybe share a little bit about your own path. Um, um, you know, when, I, when we met first, you were a classroom teacher in Staten, I, on Staten Island. And, and then, you know, you have your path, you know, and um, it's a lot of hard work, but there's also the vision and the passion that's supporting you, behind you. 
So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, thank you, Sean. Yeah, I mean, well, one thing I would say is uh, maybe I want to bring it, us back through this conversation to um, the classroom, the students, the teachers, and the parents. And I mean, honestly, just listening to Frank just now, I, I, you know, Frank is, is my mentor and my, was my inspiration as a teacher. And he started me out on this path because I went to graduate school and was studying some very esoteric things. And then I went off to the foreign service and I was working in China and Japan. And then I said, no, I want to be a language teacher because this is what I love to do. And Frank really gave me that opportunity to do that. He's been my like leading light for so many years. And so I think we as teachers, because I feel that, you know, as an older person, but I know our kids feel that for the connection with our teachers. And I want to maybe, uh, there's so much rich content that everyone's put out there that I wanted to comment a little bit on, especially again, the classroom experience and some of the um, ideas of culture and identity that have surfaced in the conversation earlier. So back in 2005, uh, seems like a long time ago. Um, yeah, I started, a, I was one of the founding uh, faculty members at a school that Asia Society started in New York City. And I taught the Chinese and Japanese languages. This is 2005. And parents were basically allowed to, you know, kind of choose which they wanted for their child, you know, they want Chinese or Japanese. And um, basically I wound up with a big group of Chinese language students and a small group of Japanese language students. Now, what was the difference? Why did why why was one choosing the one or the other? The Japanese language students, almost without exception, they were kids who were obsessed with some aspect of Japanese culture, right? Anime, video games, something that was really like they just loved Japanese, Japan. They were really interested in this thing. For the most part, the Chinese students, um, Chinese language students, were they had no interest in China or Chinese. They were, their parents chose Chinese because they thought it's 2005, you want to get a job in the future, learn Chinese. That, that was the motivation, simple motivation for them. And the interesting piece, you know, because we've talked about the soft culture, soft power and like Japanese and Korean pop culture, which is totally true. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I definitely think we need to do more like Cleopatra's doing with Chinosity, like to get sort of Chinese pop culture and this kind of youth culture more, um, more out there for students and parents to see. But what I, what I discovered very quickly was something very interesting that for my Japanese language students, actually, because Japanese is a pretty hard language to learn, like just like Chinese, the literacy component is quite challenging. And so I got all these kids who were super excited to learn Japanese, right? And then two or three months in, for some of them, my God, it was so challenging, so overwhelming. They're actually, their enthusiasm actually started to tamp down a bit. And some of them got very frustrated because they thought, oh, after two or three months, I should be able to like watch this animation show and understand everything, you know, with no subtitles, like no way, you're not getting anywhere close to that. So there was a frustration level for them that they couldn't access these things as quickly. On the Chinese side, I had a different op kind of opportunity, which was kind of a blank slate. These kids are like, why am I doing this? I don't even know why I'm here. But we got them so excited about learning Chinese just because of the, the way we were teaching, the kind of activities we were doing. We made it so fun and engaging and also accessible. You know, it was like a safe space. You could make mistakes. It was not a big deal. We moved on. Um, so the kids just really loved Chinese because of it. And then all those parents who selected Chinese because they thought it had some political economic advantage. I'll tell you at the end of the day, what was keeping them supportive of our Chinese language program was none of that. It was just what I heard over and over again was just, I don't know. She loves it. So I don't care. Like just you know, my kids coming home, talking about Chinese, they love it, they think it's exciting and fun. And so we were very supportive of it. It doesn't really matter about all that other stuff. So that was my experience as a, from the classroom level at sort of how those, those cultural dynamics played out. Maybe just finally, you know, on the, um, you know, so many interesting points, I think Bob was talking in, in a wonderful way about like the identity and how we can all kind of be part of this larger global culture. Um, I always face this kind of dilemma with like, um, in, in my schools that I've been working with in California for the last like eight years, one thing that always comes up is like the, these cultural celebrations and like what clothes you wear. And this is usually like a big issue. So I remember back when I first started at my previous school in Palo Alto, we had a Jung Chou Jie, like a mid autumn festival celebration. And I showed up wearing a suit and, you know, and somebody said, oh, aren't you gonna, aren't you gonna dress up for this? And they <laughs> meant like, aren't you gonna put on some, you know, some Chinese style costumes? And I said, I, 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 I am dressed up. This is like Shanghai 2003 or whatever it was, you know? Um, 
And, you know, I struggle with this every year to think about like, oh, do I, you know, because there's all this conversation about things like cultural appropriation and all of this, like, do I put on the, the Chinese style outfit or not? Like, what am I representing by doing it? And to Bob's point, actually, if I look historically at like sometimes who I am and what I've done, how I've engaged with Chinese culture. I mean, from a historical perspective, a civilizational perspective, you know, like from, a, from one vantage point, you know, if I'm like using Chinese language, speaking within a Chinese philosophical and cultural tradition, like I am Chinese or I am participating in that civilization. So I think that's a very interesting perspective. And, and for students, what's interesting for me is that when they take to this, it does become such a part of their identity. Um, I have a, my current school here in San Francisco, uh, Presidio Knoll School, my, my, um, my preschool director, um, at all of our uh, information sessions, I know she always says something that I think is just wonderful because her daughter um, uh, was in our program as a preschool student. And um, she's from, my director is from Romania originally. And she always says, like my daughter says, she's half American, half Romanian, and half Chinese. And she's like, the math doesn't work out, but that's really how she feels because she's really so connected to Chinese. And I have to say, when I was with Asia Society bringing American students to China each year, um, we used to, I used to bring a group of students from our Asia Society schools, mostly from New York, North Carolina, Texas, and California. Okay, we bring them to China um, for a, a couple of weeks to do, you know, trip. And they've been in all different places in China, rural, urban, different environments and interacting with other students. And at the end, I would always kind of do a little debrief with the students about their experience. And, you know, the funny part to me was always, um, I'd have a kid from like um, Texas sitting there with a bunch of Chinese students and their comment would sort of be, boy, those kids from New York and California are weird, you know? Like, and it was just like, the culture shock was about like who I am as an American. And so I think to the extent that, again, we can, we can continue to, um, to open things up in every way, connecting to the larger field, connecting to the larger world and getting people to feel comfortable and engaged with this, I think uh, we should. And final point, again, I'm gonna say it over and over again, but I think that the more we talk about politics, culture, all these big, big, hot button issues, uh, I think they're very important. But at the end of the day, I think for the success of our program, really go back to the student learning experience that translates to parents and parents are gonna be our biggest supporters. So true. And Marty, of course, of course, we didn't forget you. Okay, sorry, uh, I love all these points and learning a lot from you, but I want to go back to what Dr. Tan was saying. There is a, we need a platform for all the teachers. I believe there are more supports there out there, like just Cleopatra just share some uh, link I can see in the chat room. But I also feel maybe they, they should be a platform that will be organized by like Jeff, Chris and Eddie and Bob and Dr. Tang, because I feel that school district and the school that needs that platform to know how to help teachers. Because mm -hmm. to me, I really see te uh, school district and schools, they are the bridge between teachers and the communities. And especially when we're dealing, dealing with a lot of teacher, they're not from America. Because I can see a lot of te a lot of schools here. You were hundred percent. You were full model, like emerging schools. But like my school, we are 50-50 and one hundred percent immersion. That somehow creates some animosity among the te the parents. When the parents didn't get picked, their mm -hmm. angers sometimes projected on the Chinese teachers. And I feel that's China, That's the district and the schools. Uh, responsibility to come out and say, hey, they are only learning this language. It can, you can learn it in Spanish, you can learn it in French. You just learning, you just understanding the whole global issue with from a different uh, culture perspective. So if we can have the school district to be our bridge to connect with the community, because many teachers, they don't know how to do that. And then let alone to become an administrator, like what Bob just uh, mentioned. And I feel the school district and the school. So my school, we learned a very difficult lesson for the first few years because the parents are really fighting with each other. Chinese parents, while the Chinese students, the 
Chinese learning student, they feel they are better than the, chi- the non-Chinese students. And the parents, they are really, even during the, the recess time, pick up time, you can see the animosity among the, among the parents. So eventually we started doing the inclus- inclusive uh, method. So when we're doing cultural event, we invite the whole school, not just the Chinese students. When we're doing the dumpling making, we have the whole school participated. We teach the parents, they come in, even you are not in the Chinese program, we just want the school to kind of educate the parents to know, hey, this culture is there for everybody to, to learn, to appreciate. Just these kids, they, by draw the luck, they got into the program, they can do it in Chinese, but you still can appreciate the culture in English. So I just feel parents, they need to be educated, but that school can help to and help teachers to do that job. So the whole community can come together because we are 50-50 model. And I believe many teachers here, they probably in, maybe they're the language teacher in the high school. They especially need that because they feel there's some comments say they feel they're voiceless. And I just feel the, maybe there's a platform that can uh, provide the support for the school district and the school to reach out to the community and to help their students, help the teachers to have voices. That is such an important point. And in really it's uh, taking the, uh, the notion of inclusion to another you know, dimension because um, um, we also need to include all our um, colleagues and, and learning in different disciplines. You know, the more we make Chinese to be part of the whole, instead of just you know, one subject standalone, uh, the better it is for it to grow roots. And I think that's a notion that's very important in in today's conversation is really think about how do you grow roots um, of the for the Chinese program in your community, you know, uh, all the way from classroom to the school community and the community at large, you know. So and. Um, so at this point, I'm keenly aware of the uh, time. We can continue on because this is a such rich and rigorous discussion, you know. And I already see that next year we will actually, you know, um, have another conversation to continue and and revisit the topics, you know. Um, at this point, I would like to invite all of you to give a wow ending. And for those of you who know me, that you know about my BMW model, you know, you have a beginning and you have a middle to engage everyone, but you need to have a wow ending. Everybody walk away with some kind of sticky message in, in, in your mind or some wow, you know, uh, statements. And uh, so I would invite every one of you to give a wow statement and then we'll have team tell us what to expect. And uh, speaking of teacher certification, we'll engage more on that. Our next webinar actually is with folks at the uh, NASESPO, National Council and for the teaching of languages. That's a state supervisor's uh, group uh, for languages and international education. And uh, certification is their job, you know, Um, not necessarily their own, but they are uh, the state department, uh, state office, state government um, prerogative for uh, certification. So we'll continue that. Um, At this point, who would like to give us sort of uh, one big advice um, to, to, to our audience. I'll go. Okay, good. Um, the group that I wanna concentrate right now and address is our Chinese language teachers. I've seen firsthand what Marty talked about the difficulties, the the overload of work that's involved, uh, the amount of work uh, that they do is, you know, 
sometimes unconscionable. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're designing, they're implementing their curriculum. In addition, some of them have to speak the English, they have to teach the English content as well too. That's how the public school is set up and the way they do things. And so, you know, I want, I want all of you guys to know there are administrators like myself who are strong advocates for the, the amount of work that they do and to, you know, to make sure the, the compensations are correct and, you know, working with HR and district level on, uh, on certain, you know, benefits that they need to have. But one of the things that I do want to um, encourage our, our, our Mandarin teachers is to, to make sure their social, um, social emotional learning themselves have to be healthy. And so, you know, I really encourage all of you guys to uh, go out there and, um, you know, have a, a healthy, um, healthy, uh, healthy habit out there and to have, um, you know, practices that you are able to breathe and reflect, be able to stretch and meditate and, you know, and I will make sure as an administrator uh, to be a strong, strong advocate, you know, locally, statewide, nationally. And so I just want to encourage that you are well loved. We need you in the, uh, in the school district. You are a shining light to, uh, to our students in the United States. And we need more of you guys and to make sure that your voices are heard. Do not be shy. Go out there and say what you need to say. That's all I've got to say this morning. Encouragement. Thank you, Eddie. Yeah, who would go next? Yeah. I, I'd be happy to, I, in, in very much on the same note. I guess my big you know, encouragement for teachers, and they, I'm also speaking to teachers, is it may seem like it's a hard time right now, like this is a sort of a downtime, but it's not the end. Actually, this is the beginning of, of a new era, I think, in teaching Chinese, and that maybe you're not hearing all the voices all the time, but there are many, many people out there cheering for you. And, and including all of us on this panel, um, and for each of us, we have, we have teams and communities we work with that are really on your side. And so um, it's been a rough couple of years for all of us, and, and including your non-Chinese language teacher colleagues, everybody, right? We all are kind of picking up the pieces, but it's going to get better, and um, it's going to be different, and it's going to be exciting. And so when you return to class this school year, um, please don't forget to have some fun and to enjoy it a little bit and, and let your students have that too. It's exciting for them to be back with you. And, you know, learning and teaching a language should be fun. And, 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 you know, the minute you start having fun, some of this tension will come, get, go away and things will be back to a place that you really want to be. I, I guarantee that. So it's, you know, give it a little time, but we're, we're all moving forward together. And um, I couldn't be more excited about the future. And I hope that you are as well. Thank you. Yeah. Who would go next? Yeah, Jeff and Marty. Marty, you go first. Okay, mine is short because uh, how I start my, my school year, I, last year, I told my students that special times create special heroes. So I feel everybody here, you are all already special heroes. And I really feel you can, you're going to come into the classroom with your cape on your shoulder and everybody will be fine. Just like what Bob says, I think things are going, things will get better. And this is, a, I really feel that everything has a, the silver lining around it. So I really feel we will be fine and salute to all the teachers and including myself. And we're going to stick together and we will, we have each other to rely on. So I feel this is a really good discussion today. Thank you. Yeah, Jeff? Yeah, um, so I'd like to say that, that um, I, I think leadership matters in organizations, um, including individual schools, school districts, departments, et cetera. And, um, and so I guess my advice is, is become a leader. Um, and I think that there are obstacles to this. I think there are cultural and structural obstacles to this um, among our peers. Obviously, somebody, I think, in the comments mentioned overcoming this sort of core value of humility. Um, educational organizations tend to be hierarchically organized um, and, uh, and 
and sort of play into the into the I think a, a sort of a, a very admirable Chinese sensibility, which is to um, pay really close attention to relationships and and, and respect. Um, and there are also power issues in our society that involving language and, and nationality and gender, et cetera. But um, if, if you want to become a leader and, and to represent the ideas that have been discussed here, I mean, I think the best thing to do is to actively seek out mentorship within your organization and to ask to approach the leaders in your school or in your district and, and tell them, say, I'm interested in developing leadership. What advice do you have for me? Um, I think there are two reasons that this is a good idea. Number one is that there's nothing, well, more reasons than just two, but there's nothing more, I believe, that human being beings like than feeling as though they are needed. And if you approach an administrator and say, I need you, I can learn from you, um, that person will not only be flattered, but will be invested in your success. Um, <clears throat> and I know this personally because in my organization, the people who sort of show up and make it be known that they are interested in developing and learning, um, it frankly makes my life easier because I like to, you know, to the extent possible, you know, develop people from within. And I don't always know what people are thinking. I can't guess. So my suggestion is become a leader. And the way to do it is approach the leaders in your organization who you like and respect, push through those issues of humility, push through those sort of structural power relationships and say, I need your help. Um, and, and when we get more and more people like sort of our tribe here, um, leading organizations, I think it matters and, and we'll see some change. That's well said, so true. Um, Cleopatra, maybe? And then Chris? Yeah, so uh, my advice to teachers is never forget your why. Um, I remember my first day in Chinese language class where everyone could understand the tones immediately and I could not hear any of the tones for a whole semester. Um, and I was the worst person in the class, but I stuck with it and I worked hard because my teachers were amazing. And I ended up living in China for, you know, almost eight years. And China has been such an integral part of my life. Um, and it really changed my perspective on the world and my thinking. And so the power that you have and the influence that you have over your students is priceless. And I know in a world where it seems like everything is pretty overwhelming, U.S.-China relations is not good, your local community and your, your, uh, your students are, are going to be central um, to your Chinese language program. So true. Thank you. And uh, Chris and Tang Jiaoshou. Yeah. So just, I mean, I'd say find your authentic voice and self as a teacher. Don't get distracted by all of this political upheaval. Um, and don't stay cloistered in your classroom. I think that's the, the message that I'm hearing from everyone is, you know, about becoming a leader is connect get out there, do things with local organizations, national organizations, be close to your colleagues and your peers in other disciplines, the math teachers and the, and the science teachers and the English teachers. Um, you don't need to be stuck in your own little, little bubble. I think the more you do that, the more you connect and the more you get out there, the more advocates you're going to have for the work that you're doing. So um, just keep, you know, I think, I think just be open, connect and associate and find your authentic creative self as a teacher and don't feel that you need to, you know, speak on behalf of a group or represent some certain constituency, inspire and engage your students and everything else will flow from there. Thank you. Yeah, Tang Laoshi. Okay, uh, for all the teachers and for all of us, I think at the uh, difficult time, it is even more important that we need to think positive. We need to look ahead. Um, things always go up and down. It is almost for everything to get to a next level. This is particularly important now at this time is for teachers to have confidence and motivation to teach. And don't lose uh, confidence in that because attitude, your attitude is contagious and it may affect your students. And when your students sees a teacher coming in with confidence, with optimism, 
with all the energy, they are going to study with energy, with confidence, and with fun. One of the things I like to quote from someone says, motivation has been called the neglected heart of language teaching. Without student motivation, there is no pause. There is no life in the class. More importantly now, it is the teacher who is going to motivate the students. And your motivation means a great deal to the students. So that's my last word. Thank you. That is so true. Yeah. Um, you know, at this point, um, let's uh, invite Ting to tell us what to expect next. And, um, and then we'll do some uh, closing remark. Yes, Ting. Yeah, thank you. So thank you all. This is such a great discussion this morning. And uh, I think everybody has learned so much. Uh, so when you are paying attention to the, um, to the um, discussions, you probably uh, noticed or didn't notice there they were actually great discussion going on in our chat box. And so if you have missed anything, don't worry because we will upload uh, the entire video and the chat history uh, on uh, Asia Society's web website. And uh, I post the link uh, in the chat box. Please take a look. And you can also search for Celine and uh, uh, Celine Webinar Asia Society, and then you will easily find the web page. And we will have everything there in about a week. And also, I want to uh, do a little bit of advertisement. We will have a, a webinar coming up in September, and uh, we uh, will have more coming up. And I will send out uh, emails to all of you who uh, register for our web uh, webinars uh, this time and before. So please watch for my email. And then we will also have announcement in the social media groups. So um, that's all. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to take this moment to uh, have a shout out for, for three other individuals. You know, they are kind of behind the scene people. One is uh, for Guo Yang at Asia Society. She's uh, organizing this webinar for us and, and, and hosting it. Uh, Ting Shen for um, organizing and uh, doing all the logistics and uh, planning with us. You know, she's a Celine associate. Um, so we're very happy to have her. And my other uh, colleague at uh, Celine is Dr. Joy Payton, and she's behind the scene, but she's been given some uh, consultation. And uh, so we are very thankful for their help, you know. Um, and at this time, please join me to thank our distinguished, you know, panelists for the wonderful, rigorous, and insightful conversation. I know that we will continue because um, it, it's just so encouraging, you know, but the biggest takeaway that I get out of all the discussion point is that obviously there are a lot of uh, good discussions that point out the future directions. One is rebranding Chinese program. The other is the teachers, you know, and the other also the teacher from development all the way to leadership, you know, and how do we uh, nurture and um, nurture leaders in the field and, and others would be, you know, so many different things to do. So I'm so excited, but, you know, without our panelists, this, you know, webinar won't be as successful and in, sort of really give us a lot of uh, important insights and talking points. And we hope our audience will find today's discussion as uh, informative and, and excited as I do, you know. And one thing I do feel that, you know, the biggest message out of all this is that really believe in yourself, believe in your work, believe in your vision, believe in your passion, because the what is easy, the how will come next, you know, but if you don't have the why you are in this mission to do this work, you're not going to inspire people to follow you. And so with that, thank you. Thank you to our panelists again and to our audience.